Hello, welcome to Mindshot. My name is Philip Goff. I'm a philosopher who thinks consciousness pervades the physical universe and is a fundamental feature of it. Hello, um, welcome to Mindshot. My name is Keith Frankish. I'm a philosopher who thinks that consciousness, at least in the sense in which Philip thinks of it, doesn't exist at all. And we're very happy to be joined today by Michelle Liu and Edward Machery. Welcome to Mindshot. Welcome. Thank you. So, Michelle, would you like to start, kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, so, I'm a philosopher. I work in uh, various topics in philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, as well as uh, aesthetics. Uh, I'm currently a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Hertfordshire in the UK. And in about four months' time, I'll be taking up a lectureship at Monash University in Australia. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. I can also add Michelle is an incredible philosopher whose work I've been following for quite a long time. Very happy to have you on Mind Chat. And uh, Edward, uh, welcome to Mind Chat. Would you uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. I'm a philosopher of science and of cognitive science. I work on a range of topics from the nature of concepts to the methods of psychology. I also do some work in the philosophy of statistics. And I'm also one of those uh, experimental philosophers who try to bring experimental work to bear on various philosophical issues in uh, many different ways. Uh, and I've been doing quite a lot of that in recent years because I've had the good fortune or misfortune to be leading a very, very large project called the Geography of Philosophy. And that has taken a lot of my time in recent years. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both. Welcome to Mind Chat. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about what we're going to do today. So we spend a lot of time on this podcast wrestling with the hard problem of consciousness, this challenge of trying to explain how brains produce phenomenal consciousness or how phenomenal consciousness fits into our overall theory of reality. But is this, is this phenomenal consciousness thing something ordinary people believe in? Or is it just some wacky idea that Anglophone philosophers have come up with because they've got a, a little bit too much time on their hands. Well, Edward thinks something like the latter, although he's, he's probably much too polite to put it in the, such strong terms. <laughs> uh, and he's he's built a case for this uh, by in interviewing or surveying members of the public and trying to test their intuitions on these matters and, and try to make a case that actually this notion of phenomenal consciousness that philosophers tend to be working with isn't really something that's that's uh, an idea that ordinary people have and, and the associated intuitions as well so uh and michelle has uh written a few articles responding to these arguments by by edward and some other philosophers making making a similar case arguing that perhaps they're ignoring for example that nature of, the, of these terms that philosophers employ, if I'm using that, pronouncing that term correctly, which I might not be. So what we're going to do today is have a little bit of a maybe friendly debate stroke discussion. Um, Keith's going to kick us off by, by interviewing Edward and pulling out some of these ideas and, and, the, and the case he makes. And then for 15 minutes or so, and then I'm going to do the same interview Michelle for 15 minutes ago about how she how she responds to these issues and then we're going to have 15 20 minutes or so of of exchange between Michelle and Edward see if we can reach any conclusions if one can persuade the other probably not but we'll <laughs> we'll hopefully uh, learn a bit about the contours of the debate uh, also then I think I would like to have spend a little bit of time maybe discussing the hard problem itself what, what, what both Michelle and Edward think about that based on what we've been talking about. And then if we have a bit of time towards the end, we'll have some audience questions as well. So save up your questions. I'll tell you when to put them in. So as always, if you're enjoying the podcast with the lowest production values and the greatest philosophy, please do subscribe to the channel, write a review, comment, write a five-star review, subscribe to the audio podcast as well. If Keith remembers to update that, we might uh, get some things up there. And um, Professor, Professor, I forgot your name then. 
Professor Frankish, if you'd like to begin the discussion. Right, okay, well, I, 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 I think, Philip, you know, this, this might be a case where, where we're both on the same side because I, I do think that people oh have this, this intuition about the existence of phenomenal consciousness and... Uh, this is uh, what I've been hoping pros. for this whole uh, I, year I and a half. I've been doing this. Finally, I, we agree. I don't trust the intuition, <laughs> of course, but I tend to think that people have it. So it may be that in this, I mean, after all, I say people are under an illusion about this. So, but maybe they're not even under an illusion. So I think I'm going to cry. That's be it's beautiful. I'm sure I will find. I will find. I will find something to disagree with. Uh, 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 because I disagree with you over. But this is let's bring in let's bring in Edward here because he might be the one that that we that we both uh, that we both uh, disagree with. So Edward, um, it's I think it was two thousand and ten. I think wasn't it? Did you and uh, with Justin Sitzma you wrote a, a paper that is now uh, I, I think it's fair to say it's a classic in, in uh, of experimental philosophy, in which you. Uh, it was um, two conceptions of subjective experience. I think was the title. Yeah, and it was it made quite a quite an impact. I think because philosophers have been blithely saying for many years, look, that we all have these intuitions about phenomenal consciousness and about the problem it poses, and they and they assumed that they were simply articulating what everybody felt, and that anyone who reflected for a moment saw that there was this. Obviously, there was this thing called phenomenal consciousness, and it presented this big problem, and uh, we needed to, to, to agonize every time. Your, the paper that you and Justin wrote challenged that and said, wait a minute, that's not what ordinary people think. So can you introduce that paper and tell us a bit about what you did in the paper and what it, the arguments were and what the conclusions, what conclusions you drew from it, please? Great. So um, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to talk a bit about that work. Before doing that, I should just acknowledge that Justin Sitzma, my collaborator on that paper and on many other papers, did a lot of the work. So um, it should be very clear that uh, I don't want to take credit for the work we did together. And in fact, that Justin has been leading for four for years. So I think it's important to make that clear first. Um, I, let me just step back a little bit and tell you where yeah. the paper come from. Um, um, it comes from... Uh, what Justin and I, a contrast that Justin and I observed when we started working on that topic. So we were both reading some ancient philosophy of mind. Most is a work done by Greek philosophers on perception, on, on various other aspects of the mind. And we were both surprised by the fact that it's very hard, in fact, I think it's impossible to identify anything like the hard problem of consciousness in ancient philosophy of mind. Now, of course, it's not the case that ancient philosophers were not aware of illusions, of somehow the distinction between our experiences and reality. Skeptics were all, all over this kind of, of, of distinctions. But they never elaborated this um, 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 the notion of illusions towards the direction of what we call in modern philosophy the hard problem of consciousness. The same is true of, of medieval philosophy. There's no such thing as a hard problem of consciousness there. It, it emerges probably in the 17, uh, late 17th century, maybe early 18th century. All right, so that was our first observation. So and, the thought is there, so, sorry, sorry to but yeah. the thought is there that, that, or the, that that's the notion of illusion, you think, that, that tends to support the idea that there is a, that there is a hard problem of consciousness. No, the, 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 the thought is that the skeptics were very much aware of issues related to perception, of the distinction between perception and reality. But that never led them to think about consciousness the way modern philosophers have been thinking about consciousness. And that means there's oh, centuries of philosophy without the hard problem of consciousness. Now, can you contrast that observation with the claim made by philosophers such as a guy called Keith Frankish or Philip Goff or Dave Chalmers or uh, Alvin Goldman or Pat Churchland? So people who disagree fundamentally about the nature of consciousness, but they tend to agree about the idea that consciousness is obvious, right? It's something that we grasp immediately, that somehow we just open our eyes and we have the experience of consciousness that leads us to this deep philosophical question. 
And so the starting point was this contrast between centuries where the, there was no discussion about the heart problem of consciousness and this claim, the contemporary philosophy, that the heart problem of consciousness emerges just from our perceptual experiences. Right. And so that led us to really ask the question, but is it true that people grasp, um, as philosophers say they do, that our experiences of the world has a specific feel or, you know, philosophers love to use that expression, what it is like, and Michelle in her work talks, talks, talks about that. So that's really that led us to this question, right? So that was just a bit, a bit the background. This contrast between the claims by modern philosophers that phenomenal consciousness is obvious, it's right in our face, and hundreds of years of philosophy without thinking about that. Okay. So what we did is decide just to test whether or not lay people, people without training in philosophy, have an experience, uh, have a concept, a conception, I don't want to get into concept, conception here, it doesn't really matter, have a concept of phenomenal consciousness, by which I mean roughly the idea that our experiences has distinctive features. Now, now when we see a red apple, right, most of us would agree that the apple itself has a property, it's red. But the idea is that our experience of the apple come also with its own characteristics, right? It's not the apple itself, it's also our experience of the apple that also has distinctive properties. And philosophers call that its phenomenality, the what it is like, sometimes use terminology such as qualia. So that's really the target, right? That's this idea. So we decided to just do very, very simple work. You know, it was the early days of experimental philosophy. So it was as simple as it can get. Uh, and so the idea was to examine whether people would treat all phenomenal, phenomenal states in the same way, right? So if it's true that people understand that there's such a thing as phenomenality, right? Then you would expect them to treat everything from seeing red to feeling anger, to feeling pain, to feeling disgust, to smelling a banana in the same way, because they all have the same features, they're all phenomenal states. Now, it's a debatable assumption, but it was a starting point of the project, right? When say, well, you know, if people recognize phenomenality as such, then they should see, look from seeing red to feeling pain, there's something in common, namely phenomenality. And they should treat it in the same way in our experimental design. So what was our experimental design? Very simple. We gave people a vignette. And in the vignette, we've got either a human being or a very simple robot, a very dumb robot. We're not talking about uh, chat GPT. We're not talking about the mo most recent cutting edge AI. No, you can't, be con you, can you can't be confused. That creature, whatever it is, it's not alive, it doesn't have consciousness, it's as dumb as it gets. So we make sure it's described as being a very dumb robot. We, we call the human Timmy and the robot GB, or maybe because the other way around, it doesn't really matter, okay? And then we, uh, we describe uh, behavior, the behavior that's associated with detecting red, right? So, you know, you, you have to make a choice between green apple and red apple. So you have to detect red to be successful. And the behavior that's associated with feeling pain, for example, you're shocked, you're moving away. And then the very simple question we ask is, uh, um, uh, we asked two questions. The first one was, well, does the, robo does the robot see red or does the human being see red? And the second question was, does the um, a robot feel pain and or does the human being feel pain? I hope the setting is clear. Is that, is that, about, is that about clear, the setting of the study? It's very simple. Mm -hmm. the, second, the second question was a prediction about how, how other people would, would respond. And I, it's, it's, it's a nice twist of the study. So you're not simply supposed to give your own answer, but you're supposed to be predicting other people's answers. And we had two types of subjects, two types of participants. One, lay people, people without training in philosophy. And the other one, philosophers. Right, so we've got hundreds of philosophers. And the reason that philosophers are important in that study is that we should expect philosophers to treat seeing red and feeling pain in the same way, because they do realize there's something common to seeing red and feeling red, namely, they're both phenomenal, phenomenal states, 
right? The, the, the experience comes with its own distinctive characteristic. All right. Um, so they, um, um, so what are the results of that very simple study? Well, the results are, are straightforward. When you look at philosophers' answer, of course, they assign seeing red and feeling pain to a human being. And they treat seeing red and feeling pain the same way when it comes to the robot. The robot cannot see red and the robot cannot feel pain. Exactly what you would be expecting philosophers to say, right? Seeing red comes with a phenomenal experience. So the robot does not have phenomenality, so it does not see red. Exactly what we predicted, what we expected. But that's not what you find when you, when you look at lay people's answers. When you look at lay people's answer, they don't assign feeling pain to the robot. The robot is a, meta is a metallic object, a very simple, dumb creature. So it does not feel pain, exactly what you would be expecting. You know, it doesn't have any flesh, for example. Um, uh, but they assign seeing red to the robot. And they assign seeing red to the robot to the same extent that they assign seeing red to the, to the human being. So the key finding here is that we have a split between philosophers and lay people. Philosophers recognize the homogeneity of all the states that we, that we philosophers, at least many of us, think have a phenomenal nature. And lay people actually don't seem to grasp the commonality between the experience of red or the seeing red and the experience of, of, of pain. Suggesting maybe, at least that's our interpretation, so there's a lot of things that can be said. I don't want to uh, overstate the conclusions from this work. There's a lot of objections, a lot of fine points to be made. But our overall interpretation of that results and a few other results I might talk about later, but uh, is that for lay people, there's no such thing as phenomenality that encompasses all the mental states that philosophers recognize as phenomenal. Right. So that was the conclusion we were, we were trying to draw. Why does it matter when it comes to the hard problem of consciousness or to the philosophy? Well, our position is a skeptical one. Uh, different from, you, from your keys, it's a skeptical one in the sense that we feel philosophers need to give us a reason to take the phenomenality of experience seriously. Uh, now, you know, doors, uh, sorry, apples can be red, apples can be green, a car can be fast. And so, you know, a lot of things in the world have properties that we, in some sense, experience. But of course, we want, philosophers want something more. They want to say that our experiences of these things themselves have properties. And I think that's a move that, that needs to be justified. It's a, it's, it's a step that needs to be justified. We need a reason to go there. And, and when we've looked at the literature, philosophers give us very little justification from moving from the redness of the apple or the fastness of the car to the redness with the star, whatever that is, of our experience of the apple or the fastness with the star, whatever that is, of our experience of the fast car. Now, what they usually do is it's obvious. And in fact, you know, we, we give a bunch of quotation uh, from John Searle, from David Chalmers, from all, all these leading philosophers about consciousness. We give a bunch of quotations and they all say it's a manifest experience of our, of, it's a manifest aspect of our experience. Manifest is a word that David Chalmers uses, for example. Um, uh, John Searle uses the word obvious. I think our results put some pressure on, on this justification because if it's really manifest, if it's really obvious, you would expect lay people to have a, at least some kind of incorrect grasp, not a very sophisticated grasp. We don't expect them to have theorized about phenomenal consciousness, but to have at least a grasp. There's something common from seeing red to feeling pain, to being angry, to smelling banana, to smelling vomit, to all the different states that we recognize as, pheno as phenomenal. So that's, that's a gist. It's a skeptical argument. We try to undercut so to speak, one of the reasons for postulating phenomenal consciousness. Now, there might be other reasons, right? I'm not saying there can't be any other reasons, but obviousness and manifestness, whatever that is, uh, uh, just don't seem to be maybe the right place to, for philosophers to, um, the right way for philosophers to defend the reality of phenomenal consciousness as such. All right, so that's the gist of, that's the, gist of, of the argument as a first pass. Right. So 
Thanks. And I, I, that was terrific. That was a great summary, I think. Um, so if I could just, let, let me just see if, I, if I've got that right. That, so the idea is that when philosophers think about experience, they think about it as having two aspects, if you like. One aspect, it's, 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 it's telling us something about the world, putting in touch with the colors and the, the tastes and the smells and things out there. And then the other aspect is a, is a private internal aspect. And that's what it feels like to be in touch with those colors and smells and so on. So there's, it puts us in touch with the redness of the apple, as it were, but also there's a, a private mental feeling of redness that goes along with that. And that's the one that's supposed to create the, the, um, that's right. the hard problem. So philosophers think of experiences having these, these two aspects. And your suggestion is that this study, and, and the, your claim is that this study suggests that lay people don't think of experience, at least visual experience, of having those two aspects. That's right. They just think of it as presenting us with the redness of objects out there, and that's it. Exactly. And as, as you know, Keith, um, we're not the only one in philosophy to have that view. I mean, there's this long tradition com uh, coming in part from Gil Harman to, right. that argues that our experiences are transparent, right? So we're only in contact with the world. We're not in contact with our own experiences when we are in contact with the world. So one way to think about what we're doing is providing some experimental backing for uh, Harman's notion of transparency. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this is very much, it's very much in that intellectual tradition. The, the, the transparency claim being that, that, we, that we, when we try, when we attend to our experiences, all we are aware of are properties of things around us in the world. We're not that's, aware of any properties of the experiences themselves. That's, ex so, that's exactly right. It's, okay, well, I, I um, I, I, I mean, I obviously, I'm, I'm quite, I'm very sympathetic towards this, although there's things that I want to say, but let's, but they, people were making a distinction though. Um, they, they, weren't, they weren't thinking of pain in that way. They weren't just thinking of pain. They were reluctant to attribute pain to the, to the, to the robot. And um, I mean, on the face of it, pain seems to, to fit the philosopher's picture quite well, there's it's, it's, it's a pain experience is putting us in touch with some state of our body. It's telling us there's some damage to our body. Something's happened somewhere, um, and it's also got this this other aspect, this private feel to us, with the, you know, the awfulness of it. So that's just does that suggest though that they do have this this dual conception, this, this philosophical conception when it comes to pain? This is great. So. So paper has a negative aspect, uh, which I described earlier, but we also try to have a positive discussion of what's going on there. While is red on one side, pain on the other side. And indeed, you, you, you might think maybe the issue is they see phenomenality, but they somehow don't feel to, they fail to see that seeing red is phenomenal, right? They see it very well for pain, but they don't see it very well for red. That could be a possible interpretation of the first batch of results. What we try to do is to have a positive story about why pen and red uh, um, uh, split for lay people. And we look at two possible explanations. So the first one is internal-external. So it's not about phenomenality. One is internal, put in contact with ourself. One is external. And that's not quite the right thing, because if that's so, it predicts that smell will be treated like seeing. Right. Uh, because smell has, to some extent, an external component. And that's not true. Smell is neither like pain nor like seeing. It's in between. So that was the first hypothesis. Maybe, it's, maybe really what matters when people, when lay people are intuitively grasping, not reflectively, but intuitively grasping types of mental states. They distinguish internal from external. And I think our results suggest that's not quite the right thing to say. Our second hypothesis was in terms of pleasure, valence, what we call valence, how pleasurable or painful um, or painful. So valence, so you know, just imagine maybe there's one dimension, maybe there's two dimensions of valence, it's not quite clear, but let's suppose there's one dimension from negatively valence to positively valence in, in, le, in, le, in lay parlance from pain to pleasure. And one might think that the relevant distinction is between um, states that are maybe neutral and states that are very effective. Um, and if that's true, that makes the following interesting prediction that within a given perceptual modality, within smelling, you should be able to let to lead people to draw distinction. Uh, smelling vomit, smelling banana, people should be unwilling to assign that to 
are a robot because that's valenced. One is positively valenced, one is negatively valenced. But a smell that has no valence, for and how to do that, where well, you describe a molecule that people don't have any idea what it smells like, and I think we, we just took a, a random molecule, and then people should be willing to say, well, the robot is perfectly able to smell that molecule, right? Because it has no valence. At least not in, in your common sense understanding, it has no valence attached to that, to that sensory experience. And that's exactly what we found. That's exactly the, the, the finding. So people are perfectly willing to assign smelling a valence, smelling a, a, a molecule that is unknown to them, they are very, they are uncertain, or at the very least, ambivalent when it comes to smelling banana and smelling vomit. So I just suggest there's something right to the valence idea. Now yeah. you could respond, well, there's a connection between valence and phenomenality there, and I think that that's a possible move. But mm -hmm. I think one might also think that valence, if you have reductionist tendencies, you know, uh, or functionalist tendencies, is something that a functionalist. Uh, might actually get a handle we, a handle on in the way that maybe phenomenality is much harder to explain, right? Yeah. So the idea is that what really distinguishes pen from seeing red is not ex internal external, it's not phenomenality, it's the fact that one comes with valence. And maybe valence has some kind of some functional nature, maybe yes, maybe no. So would it be a prediction of that? And I don't know if, I, if anyone's done this, but would it yeah. be, I was just, just as you were describing that, what about somebody who 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 cares a lot about color? Say, who's a, an interior designer or a painter or whatever, who who ha does have strong valence reactions to colors, who finds some right. colors really quite quite painful to see, and others uh, evoke great you know, joy in them. The prediction would be that, that if you tried this experiment with such people, they would be much more likely to give the the, the philosophers. The Correct. Correct. Uh, I think that's has that's exactly. No, 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 no. It, it, it doesn't, we, try, we tried the other way around with, with the smells, but we haven't tried exactly this one. It's totally true indeed that um, uh, if we could find a very nice color that's definitely effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another way maybe to, to do that, you know, you've got this uh, extremely bright light that are actually um, um, negatively balanced because they're actually painful to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one might think that uh, if we could find a nice way to dis to describe them, people should be unwilling to assign them to a to a dumb to a, to assign the perception of those lights to a dumb robots. Or maybe, like maybe all you need to do is to is to is to combine the experiment with 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 a test of people's um, assessments of you, you give them a bunch of colors and ask them to say you know do you like do they, yes. how strongly do they like or dislike these colors and the people who have very strong reactions you then see what how they come out on the on the other test and the right. ones who just yeah. rate them all in the middle. <laughs> Right, right, right on target, Keith. So we, we, we had sort of, of doing that. And in fact, there's actually some, a little bit of work on the valence of, of colors and the association between colors and affectivity. So it's, you know, psychologists have already done some work about that varies across cultures. It's sometimes mm -hmm. codified in languages as well. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we had uh, a plan to do that, but I don't remember, it was now 12 years ago, 13 years ago. I don't remember we conducted the, the, the study the signal would have been very small, so we would have needed a very large sample size to get to to, to get because the associations are, are not very strong. But that's exactly right. It's exactly it would have exactly have been the right way to uh, to uh, push further the study. We unfortunately we we di we didn't do it, but I think that's exactly true. It seems something that that's, that, that that should be done and, um, yeah. across a range of modalities, indeed. I agree. Uh, comparing valence assessments with then intuitions about um, you know the, the the robot case. Yeah, I agree. Great, I, that's that, that's fantastic. I think that's a really clear presentation then of the of of how this kind of um, uh, experimental philosophy work tends to undercut the 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 the, um, uh, the claims of obviousness that uh, about about um, uh, the existence of phenomenal consciousness and the problem it poses. So I think it's probably a good time to to switch over. And Philip, you, would I are you going to? Uh, uh, to talk to Michelle about this. Brilliant. Thanks, Edward. That was great. Just a um, technical thing. You, your your audio, Edward, was crackling a little bit. I don't know whether maybe w if I don't know if it would help to turn it down slightly. It's maybe the louder words sort of a bit crackly. But anyway, maybe have I don't know if there's anything while I'm talking to Michelle. But it it, it was just occasionally, so don't worry too much. But thank you. Okay, so that's the case for the opposition or the. Uh, 
or the defense, depending on which which way around you're looking at these things. So, Michelle, yeah, I really enjoyed reading a couple of your papers on this, and I learned some new words. Uh, so maybe we could start with the word polysemy. You can you can begin by correcting my pronunciation if I've got that wrong. But maybe before we get to the issue itself, uh, could you maybe tell the audience for viewers or listeners like myself who didn't know this word, what, what polysemy means? Uh, polysemy is the right pronunciation, I think. So uh, polysemy is where you get a word with uh, multiple uh, distinct but related meanings or, or senses is what I prefer to call it. Um, so think about the English word chicken. Um, so the chicken is feathery, the chicken is chirpy. So chicken there uh, refers to chicken, the animal. We can also say something like, you know, I had chicken for lunch. Chicken is delicious. There, chicken refers to uh, chicken, the meat. Right? Uh, so you have a single word with multiple distinct, uh, but the, the, the denotations themselves are related. So polysemy, um, it's helpful to contrast polysemy with something like homonymy. So in the case of a homonym, you get a word form with uh, multiple distinct meanings where the meanings are not related at all. So think about the English word match, uh, football match, uh, matchstick. So it's really just a coincidence that um, you get these two meanings associated with a single word form. Right, got it. So, and one of the words you thought might be polysemous, if that's a word, was uh, experience, right? We commonly use the word experience. We sometimes talk about consciousness. Sometimes we just talk about experience. Does the robot have experience? What? How does the brain make experience? And I think if I'm understanding you correctly, one of your uh, responses to Edward's co-written paper was that it might be neglecting the fact that the word experience is itself polysemous in this sense. Right. right? So, Can you tell us a so bit about in, that? Uh, in the... The 2010 paper, um, uh, Edward and his co-author tested the phrase see red. Um, and later on, Justin Sitzmeier and um, another uh, co-author uh, tested a experience red, replacing see red. So I'll start with seeing red. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, polysemy is, is unlike homonymy, polysemy is extremely widespread phenomenon. Uh, about 40% of the English words are polysemous, but if you're just focusing on uh, frequent words, the number goes up to something like 80%. Okay, so it's an extremely widespread phenomenon, and often um, the senses are so closely related that uh, as a language speaker, you might not be aware that you're dealing with a polysemous word. <clears throat> so think about the word health, health, healthy, okay? So you can describe a person being healthy, describe the economy being healthy, blood being healthy, food being healthy. There you get a word picking out different properties um, depending on the object you're talking about. They are distinct properties. So, so there, healthy is a, is a prime example of polysemy. Uh, it's an example that Aristotle used. So I just want to flag out that polysemy is a really widespread phenomenon. Now, think about the, uh, the phrase sea red. Um, so I think, first of all, you know, sea red is not really part of common English, you know, you say something, see a red object or see see that the object is red, which philosophers like to use the phrase see red. See red is an idiom, really. But, you know, let's let's grant that usage of the phrase see red. Okay, so the, the, the data seem to suggest that uh, lay people um, don't attribute, uh, lay people attribute seeing red to the simple robot, whereas, whereas philosophers don't. Um, now, a number of critics, uh, in response to that paper, a number of critics have raised this concern that uh, the phrase see red is ambiguous. Uh, there's at least some informational reading or functional reading that we can attribute to robots. You know, uh, the robot can discriminate the red object from other objects with different colors, right? Um, I think that response is on the right track, but it doesn't really get to the bottom of the, uh, of the issue here. So really the word C, the verb C is, is a highly polysemous word. If you just look up in the dictionary, Oxford English Dictionary online, um, C has a really long list. Um, there are two senses that are relevant here. One is the sense that C means something like perceived with eyes. Okay. And that's a sense that applies to uh, humans and animals primarily. 
Now there's another sense of C where C uh, applies to things like radars, cameras, satellites. You know, we can talk about cameras seeing objects in the distance. That, that's a specific kind of a detection sense. It means something like detect, but only applies to machineries. Um, it obviously applies to robots. So in a scenario where you just read a vignette describing a robot successfully completing a task of picking up a red object, you know, the mention of robot, I think, naturally activates uh, this kind of specific detection sense of, of C. So really, you know, when you judge this statement, uh, the robot, uh, sees a red object, really the sentence expresses two distinct propositions, right? The robot perceives with eyes or the robot um, uh, the robot detects by way of light or something like that. So it's possible, I think it's very plausible that non-philosophers latch onto this detection sense. Now philosophers, I think, you know, when they think about see red, they really think about phenomenal experience. So maybe their particular sense is quite specific. Uh, um, so, so there, there's, you know, really, it doesn't, for me, you know, it doesn't show that um, uh, lay people does not recognize nice uh, uh, seeing red as being a, a phenomenal conscious state. It's just the phrase is, yeah, uh, the word see is, is polysemous. Um, so if I can also um, talk about the, the case of smell banana, um, which Edward mentioned as well. Okay. Um, so the, the, the result there is that um, lay people were you know, participants, non-philosopher participants were a bit ambivalent about attributing uh, smelling banana to uh, the simple robot. Okay, so think about the word smell. Smell is polysemous as well. Uh, there is a detection sense. Um, so we can say something like smell a rat, smell a cheat, as like in the very figurative sense, the metaphorical sense, smell a snitch, you know, like smell spino, we say something like smell, smell a rat. Uh, we can also say something like smell the gold if you uh, you like to detect metals, right? Um, so smell has this detection sense, but that detection sense does not primarily apply to machineries, right? Unlike the case of, of C. So I think that could um, potentially explain uh, because the distinction there, that could potentially explain the, the results. So there's an innocent, there's a fairly straightforward explanation uh, in terms of how people understand the relevant phrase. Right. Okay. So so if I'm understanding right, when, when Edwards and his co-authors say, oh, we get this different result because they, they say the robot sees red, but it doesn't experience pain or feel pain maybe they're using they get we get that result because they're using the word see not not in the sense of phenomenal consciousness uh but in the sense of this detection sense of just detecting things um right is that is that is that, is that, is that, is that yeah something? yeah right brilliant uh uh maybe then briefly about the word experience going on to yes that, so in a later similar. experiment uh by Sitzman uh, as Demir. So they, 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 they were aware of this, they're very well, uh, very well aware of this worry. And in order to address this worry, they replaced the phrase seeing red with experience red. Okay, so they, they test experience red and experience pain. So I should say experience red is not very natural sounding either, but let's agree on you know, experience red is all right. Okay, and then what they found is that results weren't so different from, from the original experiment. Okay, so seeing red, experience red doesn't make much difference. Okay, now I think uh, polysemy, the worry from polysemy applies here as well. Okay, so when think about experience, so I say something like there's a sense, it means something like feel, you know, I, I experience the sharp pain in my leg, I feel a sharp pain in my leg. But we also talk about companies experiencing difficulties market experiences fluctuations. So their experience means something like undergo uh, encounter, okay. Right, so that kind of sense can apply to a robot, okay. Um, whereas the feeling sense obviously does not apply to a simple robot. So there's again, the worry of polysemy um, and the results uh, the, the, in the, in the uh, later experiment with the, the phrase experience, Red, the results weren't as uh, as extreme as the as the original results. It was I think the people's rating was slightly lower. I think um, so. I think this this again, polysemy can uh, contribute to a, 
to an explanation without drawing the conclusion that uh, that um, lay people or non-philosophers don't have the concept of phenomenal consciousness or don't track phenomenality. Yeah. So in that case, when they're talking about experiencing pain, they'll be meaning it in the sense of phenomenal consciousness. But when they're talking about experiencing red, some of them will be latch will be thinking of experience it, it, it in a in a different sense in what in the in a sort of detection sense or undergoing or countering undergoing. sense like you know um, market mm. experiences um fluctuations that kind of sense yeah. right okay good i think that's pretty clear um so well the so the other new term i learned reading this paper was the notion of an ad hoc concept um so i knew i knew the word ad hoc but i hadn't come across this term uh, at, this notion of an ad hoc concept. So can you explain what an, actually a sound's just a, is it people hearing a sound? Is it just me? It's I've just started like hearing background it. sound, but it's like yeah. ocean sounds fine. It's it's very calming. I don't know where that's coming from. Does anyone know it? It's never happened before. It's a bit ghostly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if it stops when I mute myself. So go on. Uh, tell Maybe you're just way. experiencing it without actually hearing it. <laughs> maybe but very good okay so <laughs> uh, let's see if it stops when i meet myself so michelle could you please tell us yeah. about so uh, so so ad hoc concept is a technical notion so this is a notion from pragmatics uh, um uh, pragmatics is a branch of uh linguistics uh, it, it comes from a particular school of pragmatics. Uh, it's called relevance theory. Uh, Robin Carsten, who's a prominent linguist at UCL, she's written a lot on on, on this notion, the ad hoc concept. So but the basic idea is this. So assuming that words have stable meanings, assuming that words have literal meanings, which are stable across contexts, um, in ordinary conversational settings, we can use a word in, in a creative way to mean something different from its usual meaning. Uh, we can use the word to convey something, convey a meaning that deviates from its literal meaning. Okay, so let me give you an example. So imagine you run a reading group and uh, uh, there's, there's this member called uh, Ben. Uh, let's say Ben is really aggressive in discussion and Ben always talks over other people and dominates the discussion and he wants to set all the readings for the reading group. And you, you've received various complaints from other members of the group. So out of frustration, you say something like, Ben needs to be a human being, otherwise he has to leave the group. Okay. So Ben needs to be a human being. So there, um, obviously, you don't mean that Ben isn't a human being and needs to somehow become a member of the species human being, right? That's not what you meant. What you meant is something that um, Ben needs to be a polite and reasonable human being. He needs to be a human being that behaves. Um, so there you use the phrase human being uh, to denote an ad hoc concept where the ad hoc concept seems to be narrower than the encoded meaning, the encoded uh, concept of the phrase human being, right? So, so that's an example of an ad hoc concept. So you can imagine that uh, through repeated ad hoc usage, through repeated usage of ad hoc, a particular ad hoc concept, the phrase or the word can take some a new sense, like a, the sense can be conventionalized. And then we get an instance of a polysemy. So really, you know, in a way, ad hoc concepts gave rise to uh, polysemy. Okay. And you can also imagine that within a particular linguistic community, uh, members of that linguistic community use a certain phrase in a particular way. And when they talk, when they use that phrase, they all understand each other very well. But non-members, so people outside this linguistic community might have, might not be, you know, seem like they wouldn't be familiar with this particular usage of the phrase. So they wouldn't really understand easily uh, when um, members of this particular linguistic community use this phrase in a particular way. I think this happens with uh, many philosophical concepts. This happens with how philosophers use particular terms. Um, I think one example is the example, of the notion of consciousness. Um, the concept of consciousness. And philosophers, by consciousness, they mean something quite specific. Um, uh, so philosophers usually introduce the concept of consciousness, the notion of consciousness, 
uh, using uh, this what is like locution. So this is a locution that comes from Thomas Nagel in his 1974 paper, uh, What is Like to be a Bat? So when philosophers introduced the notion of consciousness, they would say something like, experiences have this uh, subjective, uh, qualitative character. There is something it is like to see something red. There is something it is like to smell coffee. There is something it is like to listen to a piece of music, let's say, right? So this phrase, there is something it is like, it's, again, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not part of common parlance, right? It's a philosopher's jargon. Uh, but what is, what is like locution is very much um, uh, an ordinary locution that we use. Um, so we use these locutions to talk about all sorts of different things. So you can say something like, you know, those politicians had no idea what it would be like for the UK to leave uh, the European Union, right? And then philosophers, you know, that, that, that sense is quite different from the sense that philosophers using this term. Um, Daniel Stodger, who's, um, who's an Australian philosopher, he's written a wonderful paper on the semantics of what is like talk. So for Stodger, uh, our ordinary what is like locution picks out what he calls a affective relation. So it picks out a particular way that a subject is being affected by a particular event. So think about um, uh, these politicians had no idea what it would be like for the UK to leave the, uh, leave the EU. The event is Brexit, leaving the EU. Uh, the subject there is the country, the UK, right? So the UK is being affected in a particular way. It could be an economic way, whatever contextually salient way it is. Now, think about the event of seeing red. Um, uh, seeing red can affect the subject in all sorts of different ways, right? Um, when you... Uh, when you so the locution what is like to see red uh, picks out a particular way that the subject is affected by the event of seeing red. Now the subject could be affected in a neurological way, right? So Mary, in a sense, Mary knows what it's like to see red. In that sense, okay. it could also pick out a say idiosyncratic way. You know, maybe when when you see red, you tend to get angry, right? Um, but these are not the ways that philosophers are interested in when they say that Mary does not know what it's like to see red. So they're interested in a particular experiential way, right? It's not some idiosyncratic experiential way, it's an experiential way that defines uh, the, uh, the event of seeing red. Okay. So philosophers, when they use the phrase, what is like, uh, they use the phrase in a very specific way. It's narrower than the meaning uh, encoded by our ordinary locution, what is lie locution. Okay. So, so the worry with respect to experimental philosophy, uh, studying on uh, experimental work on um, the heart problem of consciousness, the worry there is that um, if you want to, to study people's intuition about a particular concept, okay, and if a particular philosophical concept if that philosophical concept uh, is actually ad hoc concept or finds its origin as an ad hoc concept, then it's very important to make sure that uh, non-philosophers latch onto that concept, right? Um, so that requires careful experimental setting. Um, so without making sure that people have latch onto the relevant concept, then you can't really draw the different conclusions. Right. So. Just to say, uh, Keith, despite his materialist convictions, it was actually the ghostly noise was coming from Keith, which I found out by muting him, but we've sorted <laughs> that now. So he's exercised the ghost. Um, thanks, ghost Michelle. So we should say, actually, we've referred to experimental philosophy a few times. I mean, I think when people say, when you hear the word experimental philosophy, I think people think of sort of doing scientific experiments and stuff and but it's it's it has a quite specific meaning generally it's generally uh this work of interviewing or surveying members of the general public not academic philosophers to get their intuitions or their try and work out what their concepts are um on philosophical questions like free will consciousness knowledge or whatever so edward is one of one of the people who's done a lot of this so rather than just trust these 
philosophers in their anglophone in in their in their ivory towers trust what their intuitions are let's see let's see if the general public also have those same intuitions so 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 Michelle, so so is the so brilliant so so your worry is that the philosophical what it's likeness talk what it's like to see red what it's like to feel pain it's not that it's nonsense and it's not that it's totally unrelated to ordinary language use of that phrase what it's like but it's a it's a a sort of narrower concept that are, that derives from that ordinary language concept and it's in, in that sense an ad hoc concept uh t tell me if i've understood that correctly but also is there a specific uh example of where experimental philosophers have maybe critiqued this what it's like talk uh, uh which this serves as a response to yeah so th there is some work um showing that participants lay people don't seem to understand uh, this phrase and i think it's very much expected right without proper introduction lay people wouldn't understand this phrase so i think the con the concept of consciousness itself um so that the word conscious con consciousness you know i think it's a word that does not uniquely encode what philosophers mean by consciousness this kind of the word is likeness perhaps it's one of its senses maybe when when a patient wakes up from a coma, you know, doctor can say something like, oh, is she conscious? Um, maybe that's the kind of phenomenal conscious sense. Um, so it's either, so either the word conscious is polysemous or this philosopher's concept is not really encoded at all by any ordinary word. I tend to think that some words uh, do a good job. Uh, so the word feeling, especially in the phrase feeling of a feeling of something, um, feeling uh, of uh, pain, I think, sort of picks out the phenomenal aspect. Um, the word experience is not particularly helpful either, because experience usually means something like knowledge, practical knowledge. Um, so it, it's really a phenomenon. The notion of consciousness is a very particular, particular phenomenon, and it takes a lot of philosophical work or at least some work to introduce the concept. And in Nagel's original paper, for example, um, after he introduced the term, and he immediately points out that this phrase, what is life phrase, should not be understood in a kind of functional behavioral way. So in a sense, we know what it's like to be a bat in the sense that you know, bats uh, like to hang out in the dark, hang out in the cave, like to hang, hang themselves upside down, kind of. Um, these are the ways that we know um, about, you know, with respect to being a bat. Um, so then he goes on to talk about the subjective uh, point of view about being bat. And so he really narrows down this understanding of what is likeness. Right. So when experimental philosophers are trying to say, oh, this is just a made up notion, nothing to do with ordinary language. He's saying, well, that's it's, it's a more nuanced connection. It's not synonymous with the ordinary language term, but it's it's somehow connected to it in a. In a yeah, in but a the worry here is really quite general. The worry from polysemy and the worry from ad hoc concept. So um, there are other examples, you know, the notion of explanation. Uh, uh, so often, you know, if you want to test the explanatory gap intuition, you would ask participants to read a particular statement. So does this physical process fully explain uh, what it's like to see uh, pain? Right? So there's the worry about what it's like talk and there's the, the worry about explain. You know, philosophers mean something quite specific by uh, the, the notion of explanation. Um, so it's not just some kind of loose notion of making intelligible. Um, so there, there, you know, the, the, the issue here is that when experimental philosophers want to understand people's intuitions and judgments, so they would get people veneered and quest questions to, to uh, rate. And then the questions themselves can contain polysemous words and can contain concepts, philosophical concepts that are supposed to be ad hoc concepts. So without proper setup, um, it's just not clear that participants have latched on to the relevant notion. Right. So just on that point, and, and I'll, we should hand over to, to Keith, here, but that, I mean, there were, even an anti-materialist, dualist like David Chalmers, he thinks brain activity explains consciousness in some sense. Yes. He thinks it, 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 it does causally give rise to conscious experience. 
but only because there are these extra psychophysical, special psychophysical laws of nature that bridge the gap between the brain and consciousness. So he, so he would agree in some sense the brain explains consciousness. So, so you're worried that when these experimental philosophers are saying, oh, ordinary people don't, don't agree with these intuitions of philosophers, we've got to be very careful that the, 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 the member of the public is understanding the term like explanation or consciousness yeah. or in the way philosophers intend yeah. it right just when, to add another it, yeah. yeah just to add another example the the copula is so when we want to test uh so the you know dualistic intuition whether the feeling of a pain is a particular neurological feature let's say that it's well known that the the the, the, the copula is is ambiguous uh between an identity sense you say like the morning star is venus and there's also predication sense uh, John is the embodiment of conservatism, right? So that's a different sense. So when you get a seemingly and that identity statement, it's, again, it's not clear that um, lay people draw such subtle differences. Um, with philosophers, obviously, um, know that the statement ought to be understood is ought to be understood in the identity sense rather than the predication sense. So there you're thinking just finally is in cases where you say like pain is just neural activity or something. Yeah. Are they understanding? And David Chalmers would say no, but his understanding is in a quite specific way. And we've got to make sure the general public. Oh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. OK, that's so we've got the for and against. I think it's time okay. to chat um, about it. Can we yeah, let's maybe we can first give Ed a wide chance to respond to that and then we can we can broaden it out into a into a, a general discussion uh, edward so uh michelle's suggestion is that these experiments are not uh, well enough designed to get the participants to latch on to the right concept how so how do you smile i mean i guess i can see one way in which that you could respond to that very easily by saying exactly they're not catching on to this con concept the philosophers have constructed for themselves um, uh, you know, they've invented this concept and ordinary people aren't, no, they aren't latching onto it because, you know, because it's one they've invented. Um, it, tell me, what, how do you respond? Well, I think there's a lot of things to, uh, to say, um, and I don't want to just spend the next 30 minutes <laughs> monologuing. I think this would be better if we actually go back, go back and forth, but I just, you know, f following your, your suggestion. Indeed, this is my, my reaction. I'm, I'm actually at this point a little bit puzzled by the dialectic. Right, so what, what we're trying to show is indeed that let people don't latch onto the concept of phenomenal consciousness. And it is, that's what we show. And, and what Michelle is doing is not, I mean, as, you know, that's not the way she's thinking about that, but I think it's a possible way of, of forecasting what she says, is providing an explanation of why let people don't latch onto the concept of phenomenal consciousness that philosophers have indeed developed for technical purposes. Um, the word seeing, so perceptual verbs, but also um, um, uh, nouns like consciousness or, or clothes like phenomenal consciousness, mineral clothes like phenomenal consciousness are polysemous. I totally agree with that. Polysemy has been very important in my work as well for, for, for years now. And I think it's a very important aspect of uh, everyday languages in its both non technical and technical dimensions. Um, you know, we do show that the word seeing red or uh, is actually, or, and all these perceptual verbs. Are actually, are actually polysemous. But I think the real question is, what does it show? Um, and, I, and, and, and I think it's one thing to say, look, philosophers have developed another concept by tweaking, narrowing, ad hocking, if you allow me this expression, uh, an everyday concept. And another one to show that it does speak something real. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, it's easy to invent concepts at any time, I can just take any concept every day and I can narrow it down its users, excluding some using, adding new users. So that does not mean I'm going to pick a real aspect of, of reality, right? So I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, to uh, uh, grant everything Michelle is saying as an explanation of our results. Not, well, not the first part of our, of our criticism. As uh, a second part of our criticism about ad hoc concepts, I'm very happy to grant much of that and say, well, even on her account, it seems to undermine the justification for 
taking phenomenal consciousness to be real, right? You can't just say that phenomenal consciousness is obvious. You can't just say that phenomenal consciousness is the most manifest aspect of our mental life. If it is true that you need to refine the concept to, a, to such an extent that lay people don't get it without really deep discussion in philosophy. Okay? So, so dialectic here is me a little bit puzzled. Um, uh, you know, I view Michel's take not as a nostalgia attack to the kind of work I do in that paper. So it's brought a question about experimental philosophy. I think she's right. That raises deep questions about what experimental philosophers are doing. I think this is totally true. But I'm not quite sure it raises a real challenge about on ad hoc concepts for what I'm doing here. So Keith, I think I'm just you know elaborating a bit on what on on, on what your suggestion was, and I think I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm a agreeing with you. So Michel, <laughs> yeah. So, maybe so Michel, on, the, on the point of about obviousness, um, so I perhaps I'm not as op optimistic about the obviousness of consciousness compared to someone like Chalmers or Searle, you, you quoted. Um, but I'm not as pessimistic. So, um, so suppose uh, the notion of consciousness is an ad hoc concept. And the, and I, I grant, you know, perhaps lay people do not have this, do not utilize this general notion of consciousness, right? And the issue here is whether they can latch onto a the relevant what is light concept, right? And the, the issue here is whether, um, given proper setting, um, say a, a Mary scenario or some other kind of scenario. Uh, whether lay people can latch on to this uh, particular aspect of our experience. I think that's the issue here. And now with respect to uh, the, the general issue of the hard problem of consciousness. So in order to think uh, that there is a hard problem, in order to have the intuition that physical processes, um, it seems puzzling that physical processes give rise to, to consciousness, you need to do two things. One is to latch onto the concept of phenomenal consciousness or, you know, the notion of uh, subjective character, something like that. And then two is to have uh, relevant problem intuitions, uh, say the knowledge intuition or the zombie intuition or explanatory gap intuition or modal intuition. So, so the experimental work um, on the hard problem is very much divided in two strands of discussion. One is, you know, Edward's work um, uh, on whether lay people uh, uh, track phenomenal consciousness, right? And there's another strand is testing whether lay people have uh, these problem intuitions. So the worry from polysemy and the ad hoc concepts uh, certainly apply to the second strand of discussion on testing people's problem intuitions. Um, now, um, so I, I, I might be willing to grant that uh, lay people lack this general concept of phenomenal consciousness, um, uh, but I'm not willing to grant that they can't uh, latch onto, you know, this what is like notion notion that philosophers um, philosophers uh, uh, talk okay. about. Oh, uh, yeah. Are you done? I don't want to interrupt. So, so the, the reason is that there is a recent study by um, uh, Gregory et al. Uh, yeah, they, they tested Mary intuition. Um, and, and I think the Mary thought experiment really is a very nice uh, scenario to, for people to latch on to, to the what is like notion that philosophers talk about, right? So the, the, the nice scenario I think you know the zombie intuition is a bit hard for people to latch on to. It's really hard to separate the the functional behavioral aspect of um, our conscious experience and the subjective aspect because the two things tend to go together. Whereas the Mary thought experiment is a very nice scenario. It sets an, sets up a nice contrast, uh, you know, before Mary's release. And, and then after Mary's release from the black and white world, right? So, so in a sense, um, you know, if, if, if people have, and as the experiment seems to show, um, the, the new study seems to show that people do have um, the knowledge intuition. And in that case, you know, people have the intuition that Mary learned something new after, after her operation. I think the scenario is about oper color, operation to restore her color vision. 
And there you introduce the idea, okay, um, Mary learns what it's like to see red and people immediately latch onto that particular locution, what it's like to see red. Because there, you know, what it's like locution is not picking up some kind of neurological way that means Mary is being affected by seeing red. It's not picking up some idiosyncratic way. It's picking up this particular aspect of seeing red that philosophers are interested in. I think that scenario is a very nice illustration for people to latch onto that, that concept. Just to say quickly, if people don't know the argument, Michelle's talking about the knowledge argument, go to the last mind chat ep episode where we interviewed frank jackson the the author of the argument i'm sure i'm sure most people watching or listening will, will know about that yeah I, I was also curious what 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 you thought of that that study edward but anyway i'll i'll lead i'll, I'll leave you, you two to discuss great so let me just push a little bit back uh, push back a little bit i think it's important to distinguish latching onto a concept meaning acquiring a new concept and i think i totally grant you know, that's why we teach philosophy, so we actually can lead our students to, uh, at least some of them, <laughs> to actually acquire new ways of thinking about philosophical questions. And I, I'm totally willing to grant that lay people are, are able to, in the right circumstances, form the concept of phenomenal consciousness. But that's not the issue. The issue is what is, what is, what reason do we have to think this concept has a reference? to think that this concept is not an empty concept. That's really the point I'm trying to push. If it's not the obviousness of the concept, if it's not the, ob sorry, the, oh, sorry, the obviousness of the reference of the concept, namely the obviousness of, of the phenomenality of, of experience itself, what reason do we have to believe that the technical concept of phenomenal consciousness is speaking out something real? And and you know you 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 you're moving away. Okay, so now now it's not the obviousness. It's not it's not. You know we can actually latch onto this concept. Yes, we can latch onto this concept. Um, but people can latch onto many concepts that are non-referential, that don't have that refers to nothing. So just latching onto a new concept just isn't really what's at stake. What's at stake is the justification that philosophers have given, and I, to my mind, the only justification that philosophers have given for the referential nature of the concept of phenomenal consciousness. And once you undermine that, and once you don't replace it with something else, I think, I think uh, you know, the, the, the puzzle still is there. Why, why give it to philosophers that there is such a thing? Us, so what it is like nature. So that's that's my that's my reaction. I'm totally happy with with getting the learning of a new concept, the acquisition of a new concept. Um, I think this is the way philosophy and teaching works. But Keith, you want to to jump so to jump in? An example. Would this would this be an example of what you what you um what you think of? I'd take the concept of phlogiston. This this uh, exactly. concept from the early days of chemistry. And the idea was you uh, observe different things burning. I know the additions and the idea was that there's something given off. I think it's, I think it's right, given off when they burned, that they were full of something called phlogiston, and when they burned this stuff, it was given off. Is that right? I'm, I'm just, anyway, it was, it was a theoretical construct designed to explain the observed phenomena of, of things combusting or burning. And uh, it, it kind of made sense, at, at least in a superficial way, of what you observed. And you could get people to induce people to, to, um, to, to grasp this concept and to apply it. It didn't actually really work out and actually turned out that it was the opposite um that when things burn they're actually combining with something from the air rather than giving off something anyway the details don't matter but the point is it was a theoretical construct that made sense of things that you observed that people could latch on to and it turned out to refer to nothing and it, i guess is your suggestion is that that's pretty much like the concept of philosophical uh, phenomenal consciousness you can get people to uh, think about their own experiences and carve off some aspect of them and say that has certain uh, features and that cause a problem and so on. But are they actually picking out anything real? Yes, yeah, right. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice, it's a very nice analogy. Uh, that's, that's indeed my, my, my concern. Um, and, uh, um, and, and there's tons of other possible examples we give. I mean, some controversial, some, some not. I happen to believe that the um, re the reference relation, at least, is not quite real. So <laughs> words don't refer. You know, we we use words to refer. Words don't refer. It's not again. It's not 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 a new idea. Um, mm -hmm. But but after 
you know, if, if you take a philosophy of language 101, you might be led to believe that proper names, qua proper names, have a reference and not proper names are used to refer. Uh, you know, um, so taking philosophy leads you <laughs> to the wrong path. It leads you to, to to get mistaken ideas about how the world really really is. Um, so that's that's that 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 that's a worry. And, and the Fleshy study is a nice example from science, uh, and so on and so forth. Reference is a particularly good example of a distinctly philosophical notion. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's right. I mean, you know, Noam Chomsky has argued for a long time that, you know, there's no such thing as, as reference. Words are used to refer to things, mm -hmm. um, uh, but we philosophers have been misled in mm -hmm. postulating reference relations between mm -hmm. words once, and, and things in the world. Once you get into that exactly way of thinking, once you get grasp the concept and you, you see how it's applied and how it's used and it's, you know, it's everything in language you know needs to be interpreted through that lens now that's right and then you have this big problem you know, what is reference and you, and you try and sort of can we provide a naturalistic account of it and then as soon as you try to uh, look at various candidate relations that could be referenced there's problems with all that's it that's exactly that's exactly right i think the similarity yeah. is exactly the same yeah and so then maybe what you i don't know what you say ref, references are funded just a sort of brute feature that just emerges like that or or do you say maybe we're thinking of it the wrong way and maybe we trace it you know, back to the yeah. beginning. Um, yes, yeah, so okay, so the, the analogy, the analogy is very, is very, is very, nice, is very that, yeah. It's a really nice one because it's a distinctively philosophical. I mean, people talk about people. I guess people say, "Well, I was, I wasn't referring to him." They use the, the word, but they don't talk about the ref. They talk about the reference of words in that way. They, that, so that's yeah. the way philosophers have taken an ordinary bit of language and done precisely this ad hocing thing on it, and and then created a. A, a nice, a nice bit of uh, well, a, a problem, and also, I suppose, a nice bit of uh, work for themselves to do. Let's so let what do you, back on what do you think, Michelle? If it, 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 I guess the point is, if if we have to get people into this concept, they're not using it all the time. Doesn't that show we're just it's just a made up nonsense that, and we're wasting everyone's time? No, I, I, I don't. I don't <laughs> So I definitely agree well. that people can latch onto a, a ad hoc concept that fails to refer. I think that seems seems true. Yes, um, I think the the issue here is that um, so we start with something like an experience, right? And and we start with experience, and then we we can talk about all sorts of aspects of this experience. So so our concept goes from a general concept of experience, and it gets narrowed down. As you narrowing your concept, you're making reference to uh, to your own experience i think so you the check there's a checkpoint that like you're, you're you're checking your own experience and as you narrow down the concept and again you're know, going back to uh to mary's case um people agree that mary would learn something new right so people obviously think well, i'm talking about non-philosophers uh non-philosophers obviously think that there is something radically different uh with respect to mary's experience when she comes out of her uh, black white room or, or after her uh, operation um, so so I think once you have that into so you people are thinking through this this particular case right and 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 then they're isolating different aspects of seeing red there's the neurological aspect that Mary already knows right and maybe all sorts of things happen to a person when they see something red and Mary can know all these things and uh, but People can still agree that when Mary comes out of her uh, black white room, um, she there's something radically different, and that's the aspect that um, philosophers are interested in. So you you narrowing the concept of what it's like, but at the same time you're tracking you know you're tracking this reality as well, and then you're sort of carving the bits of a reality until you get to that bit that philosophers are interested in. So I I think in terms of in, in that way, yeah. So it's not like a like you know like a makeup concept. You know, you you put a bit of a like a lion's head with a with a pigeon's tail or something like that. It's not like that. You're starting with a lion and you narrow it down. You know, there's the torso and there's the legs and all that, and until you get to that bit, and that you start with something you know is part of reality. So yeah, just I want to hear what Ed, Edward says to that. But just, I mean, I guess me and Michelle are sort of on the same side of the debate here. So I mean, 
I mean, you, you, your point, Edward, seems to be, well, if, if, if this isn't obvious to ordinary people, then why are we talking about this? But I, wouldn't the thought be, well, once you get ordinary people onto this concept, which is not some radically new thing, it's just maybe a slight narrowing down of, 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 of the everyday concept. Once they do that, then it, the, its reality might seem overwhelmingly obvious to them. So the question is, once they've latched onto the concept, do they find it? its existence overwhelmingly obvious. And um, and again, yeah, th th this Gregory et al. 2019 re uh, report, which seems to show that the um, the public do share the, the, the knowledge, argument, intuition. So, um, d d yeah, well, I, I guess I'd, I'd also be interested specifically how you, re how you respond to that, that specific study. Great. Um, I mean, you know, my general point is <laughs> that we can lead people to agree with a view. Uh, it's very, you know, not extremely strong evidence for, let's say, the reality of that view. You know, uh, I, I think you've taught enough for the graduates, have taught enough for the graduates to know that leading people to say P does not mean that does not mean that does not mean that P. So, um, you know. And on the other hand, we also know, and I'm sure you had this experience, Philippe, and I'm sure Michelle and Keith have had that too, that it's sometimes very hard, even with very sophisticated minds, to get them to see what phenomenal consciousness is about. And here, what the people I have in mind are scientists, neuroscientists, and the constant confusion between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. And, you know, it's been going on for decades. And even some of the most subtle minds in the business don't seem to be getting it right. They say, oh, we have a theory of consciousness. I say, great, we've been waiting for one for 40 years. And then they say, well, so it's going to be that part, it's going to make it accessible to this part and, and that part, blah, blah, blah. I say, hold on, haven't we gone through that exercise 30 years ago? That that's not what we're asking? Exactly. Uh, it again, is again and again and again and again. So it's not totally clear that, you know, if people who have like a PhD, they've read Searle, they've read Chalmers, and they don't seem to be getting it just right. Um, uh, so, so I think there's a little bit of a worry here that there's, there's an illusion of understanding. And, you know, we, we know how easy it is to get an illusion of understanding. But deep down, I think there's actually often it's really not easy for people to get it right, what we mean. Keith, you want to add something about this? Yeah, good, that's what, say. what you just described there. When I talk of phenomenal consciousness being illusory, so many people misunderstand that as saying, you know, that, that these anything that we might call consciousness is illusory, that you know, awareness of the world is illusory, that, you know, that all, the consciousness in all those functional, meaningful senses is illusory. Of course, I don't. So I, I just, Respond to that, but yes, and of course, we, if we take this, the view you're suggesting here, we don't have to deny that this talk is, is kind of getting some traction on something. Okay, so I mean, you talked about valence. Maybe what we're doing is sort of carving off a valence aspect, a certain sort of. And this is kind of my own view that what what we're tending to is our reactions to the stimulus, uh, the you know, kind of impact it has on us, a psychological impact. Valence being a huge part of that, we're, we're kind of carving off that. And conceptualizing to some pure, mysterious, intrinsic essence, some feel. Okay, so there's something there. It's, 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 indeed, with phlogiston or reference or whatever, it's not that these concepts have just been created out of you know sort of whole cloth and we, we just invented them and given them. They're, they're, they're supposed to do some work and they're supposed to catch onto reality. And they, they do catch onto reality in some way, just not in the way that they <laughs> they just catch up. They just mischaracterize it. Uh, so. They, they, uh, so and that's why they can seem so compelling because yeah, you can see it's, there's something happening there. I and mean, the thing is burning, right? So there's something happening and we're conceptualizing in terms of phlogiston being given, given off or whatever. The mistake is to think that that conceptualization that we've imposed on it is somehow built into the thing itself. Uh, and uh, I think that happens with just as much with introspection as with any other aspect of our awareness of the world that we tend to not realize how uh, much we are imposing on the phenomenon. Yeah, uh, I, 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 
Oh, uh, let, let me let me just say one thing about the Gregory studies that has been popping up again and again and again. Um, so I, I do um, I am actually willing to uh, to grant that this is the right kind of evidence that um, seems relevant for you know um, not quite the obviousness but the availability of maybe phenomenal consciousness. One might think, look, maybe Dev Chalmer was wrong or Tunsell was wrong when they put it in terms of the most manifest aspect of our mental life or obvious. Maybe available is the right way to, right way to put it. So it's not quite transparent that there's something common from seeing red to uh, feeling pain, but it's available to us, right? With a, a minimum of, of reflection. And maybe what the thought experiment does is leading people to this minimum of reflection. Okay, so, so that's, I think this is exactly the, the, the thing that I'm, in a way, asking for in response to my skeptical challenge. You know, I think this is exactly in the right ballpark. Now, I do have worry for this kind of experiment. Um, uh, and, and the worry is really what's driving people is um, an analogy between moving from being blind to being sighted. Uh, uh, you know, people don't really understand the thought experiment. They reformulate it in, in terms of, um, what if a person who was blind suddenly becomes sighted? Forgetting about all the knowledge before, right? And and they say, well, yes, you would learn something. You would learn how to discriminate things. You would learn a lot of things. And they use this intuitive understanding of a situation that seems to sort of make sense for many of them as a way to answer the original question. So I'm, I'm actually, um, you know, I'm, while I think this is exactly the right was the right way to push back in response to my challenge, I, I I have a little bit of a concern about how people really understand the Mary thought experiment, whether they really take it seriously, and and whether it's actually really doable for non philosophers to take it to take all the premises of the scenario for granted. Um, there's been a lot of work recently in experimental philosophy challenging the use of philosophical thought experiments to study lay concepts um, because it's often very hard for lay people to remove their own assumptions about the world, the actual world, and to replace them with fictional assumptions that they bring to bear on, 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 on the matter. So I, I, it's, 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 not, it's not a very serious challenge. You know, I think that the David here is in the detail. For my challenge to stick, I'd have to go back and show that maybe lay people have misunderstood some of the assumptions or not, not taken them seriously. And I haven't done the work. So, you know, I want to be quite careful in the way I'm putting my, my objection. But my response would be, is it really the case that lay people understand the sort of experiments to take it seriously, not in the sense of, in the sense of accepting the premises deeply? And not just use an analogical situation to give to give an answer. And, uh, that's you know that's the best I can do uh, 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 now while conceding that this is um, a good response to my type of concern I have. What do you think, Michelle? Oh um, uh, yeah, I think that's a legitimate legitimate worry. I think, um, uh, but you know, as far as that experiment goes, you know, there's a very detailed. Uh, Vignette, and then the scenario is, I think, less that's less incredible than Jackson's original case. I think the mm -hmm. scenario is that Mary is a scientist, and those are, you know, physical informational aspects of seeing colors. Uh, and then there is this operation available to her, and then she can she can. And then there's also I think there's a description about the operation not being very reliable to start with and then start with and then the operation being reliable. So there's a really sort of detailed scenario. So so as far as that experiment goes, for me, you know, I mean I can see the general worry there, but I'm not um yeah, I'm not seeing the what exactly about that experiment that gives rise to that that specific worry. Yeah. I, I agree. So David is in the details here and I don't have the, the study right in front of me to make my case stick in a way that, um, you know, compelling. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to grant that. Yeah. I mean, one thing for, for what it's worth, that I do find undergraduates get onto the concept of phenomenal consciousness incredibly quickly compared to any other. You know, there are these technical philosophical concepts for 
grounding, metaphysical necessity, uh, all of these things, modality, and you know, it's a it can be a real struggle. But phenomenal consciousness, you know, they they do get it unbelievably quickly. And for what for what it's worth, again, David Lewis uh, has this great short paper. Should materialists believe in qualia? And he was inclined to think, although ordinary people don't have the concept of a word for qualia, they do have the concept. I mean, so, I mean, I guess it may, maybe perhaps it depends, you know, what exactly, we just need to pin down what exactly is going on here. So, you know, I mean, Edward's got this worry that, you know, of course you can lead people astray. You can lead people into thinking some confused notion, but I guess it, is that what's going on or is it just, I mean, am I understanding you correctly, Michelle, that it, it, it's almost as though that they actually do have the concept, they just don't have a single word for it and all we're doing essentially, or, or in the ideal experimental philosophy, may, uh, you know, all we'd be doing is helping them understand what these words mean. It's not like creating some new concept in them, it's just helping them understand what the words mean because there's no single word that corresponds to that cut. Is that it or, or am I missing? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that picture. I'm also happy with the picture where they don't have the concept and they can latch on to a concept. So I'm happy with both. Um, so because I think there are other words which can capture philosophers' um, notion of what it's like, you know, the word feeling I said is a pretty good candidate. Um, I, so I want to just add on that point um, on what Philip just said. So my experience is quite similar. I think, you know, when you think about an ad hoc concept, a, 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 a speaker uses a phrase in a particular way that deviates from its usual meaning, right? So as an interlocutor, as a, a hearer, you can fail to latch onto that concept fairly easily, right? So it could be that the speaker is not particularly clear in conveying the concept, it could be that the addressee is just very confused, right? Or it could be that the conversational feedback mechanism is lacking somehow. So ordinary conversational setting, we have this feedback mechanism. If you don't understand, you can ask your speaker to clarify. But this feedback mechanism can go wrong fairly easily. So, so there's a lot of multiple parties involved. Um, in, so in order to latch onto an ad hoc concept for addressee, there's lots of factors have to be in play. So similarly, with respect to uh, philosophical concepts, which are ad hoc concepts, I think uh, the, the, the worries from ordinary setting applies here as well. You know, the teacher could just be not particularly clear or uh, the addressee um, has some kind of background assumption and they're just too fixed on their background ideas and refuse to hear the ad hoc concept. And oh, there's some kind of um, explanation, the feedback mechanism just not particularly good. Um, so I think it's sort of expected that some people don't latch onto that concept, uh, but if the right conditions are in place, again, I think the thought that Merrick's experiment is a great uh, way to introduce the notion of uh, a consciousness for students. Um, so my experience is that people, some students find it hard to conceive uh, philosophical zombies, uh, but most of them would find Mary, you know, Mary learned something new after coming out of the black white room. Yeah. What do you, I mean, maybe this is coming down to, um, I guess what, what really is, a, is a, it we're interested in ultimately is, is there a genuine problem here? So maybe, I mean, maybe we could just move the conversation a little bit on to, uh, it'd be nice to talk. I think Keith's interested to talk about, you know, what, more general conclusion about the the work that the point of experimental philosophy and uh, and what we think about that quite generally. But maybe just before we get there, thinking about w what does all this show about this hard problem of consciousness? Um, maybe Michelle, you could just say, you know, what what you think about the problem in the light of what we've been talking about, and then maybe Edward could respond with, I guess, his more skeptical view on the matter. So. Um... So with respect to experimental philosophy, um, uh, would you, oh, oh, just, oh, you do that first? Uh, I was going to do it that way around unless you unless you'd prefer to do the latter first. Or... Oh, no, no, I can do experimental. Okay. Philosophy yeah, first. I think so. I think oh. Oh, no, I okay. am someone who is quite cautious of my own intuitions and, and, and of philosophers intuitions as well. So as an undergraduate student, I just had 
you know, I, I didn't learn philosophy in mind in, uh, during undergraduate. So I approached the heart problem as a graduate student. And so with undergraduate uh, philosophy courses, I just had all the wrong intuitions, especially in philosophy of language. Um, um, so, so I'm generally quite cautious of uh, philosophers claim when they say this particular claim is very intuitive or water refers to uh, H2O. Um, but when I first approached the heart problem, I just had all the right the right intuitions. I remember reading people like Chalmers and and uh, Joe Levine. Um, so maybe you know because I was trained enough. Uh, or I was trained in a particular way, you know, as a graduate student, I was able to uh, latch on to the received intuitions. And I think as I grow older, I started to have uh, externalistic intuitions about language as well, although I'm still very much internalistic about meaning. Um, so, you know, things can change as a matter of, intuitions can change as a matter of uh, uh, philosophical training, uh, and people certainly can have very different intuitions People from different cultures can definitely have very uh, different intuitions. So I am cautious about intuitions. I think it's very fruitful uh, to test uh, uh, non-philosophers' intuitions about these problem intuitions that philosophers of mind appeal to when they advance um, uh, advance uh, arguments against physicalism. What What do you think, Edward, about the go the value of experimental philosophy? In, in more generally from this case? Um, well, I think there's a, there's an issue of ad hoc concepts, meaning that the concepts philosophers are interested in aren't identical, so not unrelated to lay concepts or to some of the concepts lay people have, because I think lay people have many different concepts or many different meanings associated to a different lexical item. Uh, is, a, is a genuine problem. And I think it's obviously true in some parts of philosophy. I mean, I, I, you know, I've never been really interested in thinking that experimental work on, folk, on the folk concept of causation, while very interesting in itself, has much to say about philosophical work about the nature of causation. Uh, just because there's such a gap between our layer understanding of causation and what let's say causation is and what we how we should theorize about causation so, and so and it's the same is true for explanation an example that michel mentioned earlier you know philosophers of science have theorized about explanation for now 70 years and i think there's a disconnect between um the lay understanding of explanation and um, and and what philosophers mean or scientists mean by by, by explanation or what explanation should be and often I do think we philosophers are in the business of a slightly normative business. We're not simply in a matter of describing what concepts are. We're also in a matter of register, you know, regimenting those concepts, improving them, changing them, engineering them as, as, a, <laughs> as a fad goes. Um, um, so, so I think the point is very well taken. On the other hand, it's also true that in some contexts there is a deep interplay with um, some philosophical work, so philosophical works on some concepts and lay concepts. If you work in ethics, for example, you really want to bring back your theorizing about the rights or wrong, about equality, about all these notions with lay concerns, right? After all, you want your views about the right and wrong to inform decision makings in, in everyday life. The same is true for, for justice, the same is true for any of these small concepts. I think it's partly true in epistemology too. Uh, you know, there can't be a complete disconnect between theorizing about knowledge and what let people mean by, by, by knowledge. So, um, um, so I, while I think in some cases there's a very clear disconnect, on, in the other cases, the disconnect must, if there is a disconnect, must be really small, such that the work done using a technical concept can be brought back to, to, to lay concerns. Anthony Appiah has written some very illuminating pages on the on you know the moving away, but the need to move back to philosophy to be brought back to everyday concern in at least some parts of philosophy. Um, and I think I think that does put some constraints on on how far away we philosophers can go when we theorize about some specific notion, how ad hoc, oh sorry, how ad hoc our concepts 
can can be. And I think that does give us still some some role to play, even if it's if I grant the point about you know the technical nature of many of the philosophical concepts. It it suggests that we at least in some areas the lay users of the relevant world are still relevant for philosophical theorizing because if we go too far astray, then a philosophical theorizing won't have much to say to the original concerns that philosophers had. I mean, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, you know with a debate between Carnap and Strawson here about explication and Strawson being concerned that explication leads philosophers to a place where we can't say anything to our original concerns. And I think that's the point I'm trying to articulate there, right? So we can't we can't move to technical concepts that that are so far away from the original lay concepts that we can't say anything about them. Right. And that justifies the role for modern philosophy to some extent in some areas, not everywhere, uh, but to some extent in some areas of philosophy. Mm. That, that's 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 really helpful, Edward. I was just I was just going to ask a. A general question about what what's the value of of uh, experimental philosophy? Um, I can see a case for saying that it has relatively little value, and that it just tells us how people are disposed to think about things. It doesn't tell you that it's the right way to think about things. And I mean, an obvious example of this would be thinking about uh, everyday concepts uh, uh, in physics, I mean, with, with everyday notions about space and time and so on uh, just don't hold up when it comes to uh, doing serious physics and um, they seriously mislead us and they need to be corrected um, but as you've just pointed out them that doesn't uh, th that sort of worry um, maybe gets a grip in some areas but in other areas think about ethical concepts for instance where these concepts structure how we live together um, and then uh, it, it, there is, a, there is a, a, the question: how, how should we live together? It's not that there's a, necessarily an objective answer to that. Our concepts of how of how we should live together are part of what the phenomenon we're trying to to understand. Uh, so maybe what I, I could ask you then is: where do you think this sort of ex? Well, you, you've already partly answered that, but maybe you could bring Michelle in as well. Do you think X Phi has any role? Serious role well to play in thinking about the nature of the mind, for example. Um, the assumption be behind this this debate that we've been talking about seems to be that it does, and yet it seems to me that that actually falls more on the physics side than on the ethics side. Uh, the mind is whatever it is, and I mean, if I, you know, if I think of it as an immaterial soul, well, okay, that's how I think of it, but it doesn't mean I'm right to. So. What's the value of X phi in philosophy of mind? Great. X phi uh, stands for experimental philosophy, experimental by the philosophy. way, just in case people don't That's know. That's true. Not, not like X phi is talking about the <laughs> you know, UFO and other things like that. Um, uh, really good question. I, I, I will grant that um, on its face, indeed, theorizing, you know, I'm also a naturalistic philosopher, I'm also a philosopher of Coxi. And when I theorize about various aspects of the mind, I don't really bring experimental philosophy to bear on some of these questions. So I will grant that um, in most situations, the situation in theorizing about the mind and in ethics and maybe epistemology is really quite different. Uh, we don't necessarily need to bring back our concerns to a lay understanding of these matters, no more than a physicist bring back his or her concern to a lay understanding of space, time, and matter. So I think this is totally true. That's why the arguments usually in this area, at least when I formulate them, have a slightly different bent. They are usually skeptical arguments. <laughs> you know, they usually, you are introducing an, a, a notion, you scientists, and you're not providing us a reason for thinking, or so, or you philosopher, and you're not providing us a reason for thinking that this notion is has a reference rather than being an empty notion. You say its reference is obvious. I say it's not. Here's some reason to believe it's not. Now, it does not mean does not mean there's no such thing as reference of phenomenal consciousness. It just means you owe me an answer. All right. So, so the role here is really quite limited. It's in a way putting a constraint on the justification of theorizing. No, don't take for granted that these notions are referential. 
Uh, and that's a much, much narrower use of experimental philosophy compared to maybe it's using ethics or, right. or maybe epistemology. So I like that. So it's not, it, it's really a check on the complacency of, of so, the this, is, this is exactly the way I've been thinking about the paper with, 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 with Justin. I mean, again, it's a reaction to what I thought where, you know, the quotes by Searle and Dev Chalmers and a bunch of other people were just, were just way too quick in, in, in just assuming that uh, we can just theorize about this alleged phenomenon without doing some more work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's in a way just, just I mean, that is a, a fairly uh, humble and minimal way of putting the project. And I think mean, that's, that's probably something we can all agree on because we do tend to get into this, this little circle where we're, we're, you know, we're, we're quoting each other's statements of a problem and, and so on. And, you know, it, it, yeah, wake up, get out a little bit, um, get a broader perspective on it. That can't be a bad thing for, for, for any of us in any area of it. Do you have a similar view, Michelle, on Yes, I have, I'm 100% on board. I think that there is a role, but the role is very limited. So um, philosophers of mind, you know, I'm thinking about people like David Lewis, Frank Jackson, um, David Chalmers, you know, they, they all care about intuitions. They all care about preser preserving as much a part of folk psychology as possible. So, so uh, Philip mentioned this paper by um, David Lewis, Should a Materialist Believe in Qualia? Right. In that paper, it's a four page paper, it's one of my favorite papers. Um, he lays out uh, the uh, folk theoretical roles of qualia you know there's five or five of them i think and and then so he makes these uh assumptions that this this particular feature of qualia belongs to folk psychology that feature belongs to folk psychology and his conclusion is that um there is materialist has to give up uh, some part of this folk psychology but you can have a good enough notion of qualia. Um, so I think because philosophers make the, these kind of assumptions about what belongs to folk psychology and they care about, I, I think philosophers of mind certainly, philosophers of minds who th theorize about consciousness certainly care about intuitions and folk psychology. I think there is a role for experimental philosophers to play here. Yeah. Brilliant, right, yeah. So just folk psychology, actually, if people don't know what that means, tends to, the word philosophers use to mean ordinary people's conception of psychology in the mind. And um, Okay, well, if people, I want to move to questions uh, fairly soon. So if people want to want, want to raise questions in the chat, um, do that now with a queue at the start, ideally. But just, just the last few minutes before we get to questions, just like maybe to get to people where you go with this in terms of the the issue itself so what what is your view michelle on the hard problem of consciousness and in the light of what we've been discussing right so um i definitely believe there's a hard problem of consciousness um and and the reason i think this way is because i i do have these uh problem intuitions um, so to start, i agree with the starting point uh, that philosophers uh put forward or when they uh, try to make a case for the hard problem uh, so for me, um, I have a strong dualistic intuition, the intuition that, so once I latch onto the relevant concept, the what is likeness of experience that philosophers talk about, I have a very strong intuition that uh, this aspect of, of our experience is, seems to be non-physical. Um, so again, you know, why, why do I think this way? You know, I ask myself, why do I think this way? Um, so Philip and I uh, agree, I think, on, uh, what is known as the thesis of revelation. So it's a quite a uh, bold claim. The claim is that the essence of the phenomenal, the quality, the character of our experience is, is revealed to us in having the relevant experience. Um, so I've done some, some, I've got a linguistic argument. I think Lewis thinks, David Lewis thinks that uh, something like revelation is very much part of our folk psychology. And I've, I've given an argument why it's part of a folk psychology. I've got a linguistic argument. Um, so, so the worry here is that if you think revelation is very compelling, uh, but, but perhaps I can explain a bit more about what revelation is, you know. Um, yeah, go for it. Imagine, imagine, you know, you're lying on a beach and uh, look at, you know, look, look at the blue sky above you. You know, the sky is purely blue, right? So you're having a visual experience. And experience has a certain uh, phenomenal qualitative character that philosophers talk about, right? 
And it just seems so obvious to me, seems very compelling to me that I know what it's like to have that experience. You know, let's say this experience has a phenomenal blue character. I know what it's like to have an experience with that particular character. Um, and it seems like my knowledge is really substantive. It seems like there's nothing hidden. Um, obviously, I, I, there's lots of things I don't know about pheno phenomenal blue, right? I don't know what phenom phenomenal blue can do to me. Um, uh, I don't know what's going on in my head, but it seems that the subjective character is transparent uh, to me. So this idea really goes back to, um, you can find some versions in Descartes, in Hume, uh, in contemporary philosophy, uh, in, in uh, Thomas Nagel, uh, Philip Goff has written a lot on this as well. Um, so it's a very compelling <laughs> idea. It's a very intuitive idea. And I think I have an argument for its compellingness as well. So when it comes to the subjective character, the, the phenomenal character of our experience, we don't tend to draw an appearance reality distinction. We tend to think that uh, the essence is is not hidden, like you know, unlike the case of water um, or other scientific concepts, uh, other scientific kinds. Um, so you know, once you think revelations are compelling, and there's so Lewis rejects revelation because um, because it, he thinks it's incompatible with his physicalism. So if you think the essence of the, the qualitative aspect of experience is revealed to you, and then the physicalists would say that that phenomenal blue is just some pattern of a neurological firing in your brain, right? And if you believe in revelation, if, if you believe that the essence is revealed to you just by having the experience, and then the experience doesn't tell you anything about neurological firing, and then it seems that, you know, revelate, if you believe in revelation, uh, a straightforward kind of identity physicalism will get ruled out, okay? And there's much to say about other versions of physicalism, um, so I, so I find the revelation really compelling, and I think that's what underlines my dualistic intuition and motivates me in in believing heart problem consciousness. Yeah, maybe, maybe I could just briefly add that's it. I guess I can't resist it. There's something I've written on a lot. Now, I guess this is where, where I differ from David Chalmers, actually. He, he sets up his argument against physicalism or materialism in terms of his two-dimensional semantic framework, and I think that begs a lot of questions, makes some contentious assumptions he doesn't really justify. And I, I've defended it instead in terms of this revelation thesis. I mean, the way I like to give it is I think, you know, if you think of pain, pain is is just a feeling. Or I mean, think, I'm thinking of a, like a specific pain one is having at a particular moment. When you're talking about the pain, you're talking about how it feels. And that's what essentially defines it, how it feels. And you know how it feels when you feel it. So you know you know what essentially defines it you you have a, a sort of immediate access to what essentially defines it and then as michelle says this leads into i mean there's a lot of a lot of things that need to be put in place here but this leads to an anti-physicalist argument because if pain is just some neural state uh and we know the essential nature of the particular pain we're having we ought to know it's essential physical nature. We we ought to know the uh, the pattern of neural firings that essentially constitutes it, which which we, we clearly don't. You have to do some neuroscience to work that out. So yeah, I mean, and and as you say, David Lewis, for what it's worth, did in that short paper uh, think that um, this is part of what ordinary people think. This this uh, this revelation thesis. He didn't use that term. Maybe we should do some experimental philosophy on uh, so whether I, people I actually... whether people are committed. I have done some some preliminary data, so um, so I so I want to see whether uh, lay people um, subscribe to revelation, right? Whether it's a part of folk psychology. So I've a test. So my reasoning there is that if um, lay people find revelation intuitive, uh, if it's part of our folk psychology, then it's likely to be manifested in how we judge certain linguistic utterances. So I've tested some sentences. So consider these sentences, okay, the following sentences. I know what gold looks like, but I don't know what gold really is. Okay. I think that's a fine sentence. I know what an itch feels like, but I don't know what the feeling of an itch really is. Now, I know what an itch feels like, but I don't know what the feeling of itch really is. So unless you're a physicalist, unless you're already thinking about the metaphysical theory or these metaphysical debate about the nature of consciousness, 
uh, very likely uh, you would judge the sentence, the feeling sentence to be odd. So I've collected some data and the people do judge these two sentence, sentences very differently, the goal sentence and the, the feeling for each sentence. People give a high rating of oddness uh, with respect to the feeling for each sentence. But it's not obvious, you know, there, there could be all sorts of different interpretations going on when people make a linguistic judgment about oddness. There are different interpretations about knowing what something really is. But at least there's a reading, I think, knowing what something really is, is like knowing its essence. Okay. So, so I think, so I give a really long argument arguing that um, the, the, the fact that revelation is a part of our ordinary conception experience best explains why people think the sentence to be odd, but it's a, it's a long argument. Um, so the, 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 the moral of the story is that uh, I think people tend to uh, draw a appearance reality distinction with respect to things like gold, but when it comes to feeling of itch, uh, they tend to think that there is no hidden essence. Very interesting. Right. So Ed, that, that's really interesting. Edward, maybe you could share your view on the hard problem of consciousness and then I mean, we can move yeah. some questions. I mean, my views won't quite surprise you, uh, you know, given 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 what I said. I tend to be uh, skeptical that there is any such thing as phenomenal consciousness, you know, mostly because I'm deeply committed to transparency as as a fundamental fact about our, our, our experience. You know, I know what it is for an apple to be red. I don't know what it is for an apple to look like red in any other sense that I know for an apple to be red. Uh, no, no more than I know what it is for um, a, a car to look fancy. Uh, I know what it is for a car to look fancy, but I don't know what it is for me to feel like that a car looks fancy in any other sense that I know for a car what it is for a car to look fancy and so on and so forth so i have a clear understanding of what it is for things to look one way or the other that i know and actually to be one way or the other or to look one way for the other that i or have a good understanding i literally have no idea what it means for me to uh, know have some understanding some acquaintance with however you want to put it me um experiencing things in one way or the other. It's it's just something I literally, I just can't, can't wrap my head around. And I think in that way, I clearly belong to, <laughs> I'm very happy to side with the folk. I'm very happy to think that I'm actually, um, um, I haven't been corrupted by decades of uh, mistaken philosophy of mind. Um, and so as a result, uh, you know, I, I, find the, I, I find for me very hard to get into the hard problem of consciousness, um, just because I don't think there is very much there that needs to be really explained or that's really puzzled or puzzling. So that's that's in a way my my my, my position is I view the hard problem of consciousness has to be rooted in um, um, uh, uh, a knowledge of oneself or an acquaintance with one's own experiences that I just don't have, I just don't share. Um, so that's that's uh, that's my 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 attitude. And notice it differs. Well, it's not one that some philosophers have had similar views. It's very different from the kind of projection that of the hard problem of consciousness that you get from people like Pat Churchman, Paul Churchman, of course, and Alvin Goldman, who says that you know this notion of consciousness is a folk notion that needs to be rejected because science is going to move us beyond this folk understanding of consciousness. I think like the Churchlands, I think Goldman are mistaken in his characterization of the sources of the hard problem of consciousness. I think the hard problem of consciousness is rather a philosophical invention. Uh, and that actually does not capture any aspect of 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 the mind of or experiences of the world out there. So that's 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 the position. Very quick comment. Isn't it fascinating here how we, there could be such huge dis apparently huge disagreement between I know those who think that this is that, that the most obvious and immediate feature of our experience and the thing that, that just re revealed to us so immediately and powerfully and that and others who think I just don't get it at all psychologically at least that's a fascinating phenomenon how do we manage to get ourselves into these these two apparently radically different mindsets and what is it about introspection that that allows us to go both ways uh, and assuming we're not actually completely different from each other 
Anyway, fantastic. Let's... We we've got loads and loads and loads of questions, and um, <laughs> I'm trying to find the beginning. But let's start with Mark O'Brien, disagree disagreeable me on Twitter, who's uh, who's certainly on the materialist side, but he he's got a question for Edward here. How does Edward account for the how easy it is for people to latch on to the hard problem of consciousness? For example, there's plenty of sci-fi which explores the question. It's not all academic philosophy. So if this is something made up by philosophers, how come it's so easy to latch on to? And I'll try and find the first question while you answer that. I so I'm not a, I'm not sure exactly what Mark is referring to here. So it's possible to, uh, um, in a sense, lead people to think that false problems are genuine problems. You know that that happens again and again and again. The history of thought, um, and I think it's very difficult. That's what teachers do. I think you know. Um, 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 Earlier, we saw the, the idea that what, you know, even if the concept of phenomenal consciousness were not referring to anything, it might be related to, I mean, I think Keith is the one who suggested this idea, to something that's definitely genuine, the fact that there is such a thing as, as balance, for example. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe the concept of, maybe people have an illusion of understanding because it's not unrelated to some things that are genuine experiences, some state of balance, some mental state of balance, others, others are not. And that might lead them to actually have an illusion of understanding. I get the same answer to uh, Michelle and Philippe's point earlier about the recent work on, on phenomenal consciousness, that I worry about the illusion of understanding with respect to some of, of, of these notions. So I, I tend to be quite skeptical that people actually really deeply get the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, I think philosophers, of course, do. We are trained to do that. We spend hours thinking about that. Some lay people have read a lot of philosophy, and so, of course, they do get it. But, but I do think it's not quite right that people really get the, the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, I think they have an illusion of understanding of what is going on there. And I mean, yeah, I, I hope I hope I don't sound arrogant in, 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 no, in, 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 in saying that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, not at all. <laughs> Yeah. We're used to strong disagreement on this yeah. podcast, but all done in a friendly way, which you're you're certainly doing, Edward. Thank you. Uh, do you, Do you want to say anything on on that, Michelle, or should we move on to? Or... Uh, yeah, we can move on. Uh, we got another question for Edward, and then we'll come to questions for Michelle. So, um, from Queerdo, friend of the show, Edward said it might be impossible to identify anything like the hard problem of consciousness in ancient philosophy of mind. Isn't that because they weren't physicalists? I was actually thinking the same thing myself. Actually, hearing this. Is it maybe it's so maybe this problem arises in the 17th century because we get this conception of matter from Galileo and Descartes, which is purely quantitative, purely mathematical. And then people have they say, oh, well, what, what about the um, the quality, the subjective qualities? They don't seem to fit into that conception of matter. And, and indeed, Galileo thought that, which is why, he th you know, he thought we need to take them out to to uh, to create a purely quantitative science. So. Um, no, this, is very, this, this is very good. Uh, I think that's a possibility. But of course, as you know, there were tons of materialists in ancient philosophy. You know, the Epicureans were, of course, not physicalists in our modern sense. They didn't think that matter was anything like a substance only characterized by um, a measurable properties. But they were, they, they were materialists all the same. And many of the skeptics were materialists. And in fact, if you just look at the history of ancient philosophy, you can see that materialism was actually pretty much not maybe the dominant, but very, very common in, in ancient in ancient thought. It might be, and here's the details matter again, that the type of materialism that was prominent in, um, let's say, during uh, among Epicureans and among some 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 in the, uh, the skeptical thought of ancient philosophy was not conducive to the hard problem of consciousness in a way that uh, the type of materialism that emerges. Uh, with Descartes and to some extent Galileo's understanding of space uh, is conducive to 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 that. Um, um, I think that's um, possible. Uh, after all, it's it's yeah. I, I think that's that's possible. I'm not entirely, I'm not totally certain. Um, um, but that's that's a reasonable that's a reasonable speculation. Yeah. Um, Michelle, you you can add something on that if you want, or maybe you can have a go at this question from Oscar. On the Mary's room experiment, have there has there been studies on how much people think Mary knows? Anecdotally, people have seemed to understand it as she has read a lot of books and would test well. So, are we sure that 
the the the, the people um who've been tested and maybe in you know more about this maybe in this gregory at al 2019 paper are we sure that she that they have the setup that she knows all the physical facts or however they lay it out yeah i think i think i think that was very clear um i don't have the study in front of me but it's a very long vignette um, and, and there's a section describing what mary knows and there's a section describing the the, the operation that she she will be undergoing um and then there's this question. Uh, so they did a pre-operation question. They asked participants. So they even the question is quite detailed. You know, Mary knows all these physical facts. Let me see whether I can find it. So, so yeah, they have a pre-operation uh, question. So knowledge pre-operation before Mary's operation. So the operation is supposed to give Mary uh, uh, color vision. So the, the pre-operation question is, uh, is this before the operation, Mary knows all the physical information about what will happen when she sees a uh, red tomato, but she has not yet seen the red tomato. At this point, does she know what it's like to see red? So there's a pre-operation question. And then they also had a post-operation question. And they also had a question about imagination, whether Mary can imagine uh, what it's like to see red. So 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 the 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 statement that Mary knows of physical facts um, about color vision was not only contained in the vignette, but also was brought up again in the in the question. So, and this is only once. This 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 is the only study on the knowledge uh, knowledge argument. Thanks, Michelle. A question from Matthias Michelle, previous guest on the show. Check out that episode, one of the first ones. Uh, question two. Okay, I've lost your question. Well, I've, I'm afraid I've got a bit. There's been so many questions I've got out of control with it i need to next time i'll note down that the, the the time at which i said ask a question but anyway Matthias says is there any experimental philosophy work about the transparency intuition just for people who don't know about this edward mentioned this this is the the, the idea that uh, many philosophers accept that when we attend to our experience what we find ourselves attending to are, are, are qualities of the external world so when i think about my experience of the pink bottle what I find myself attending to is the pinkness of the bottle, not any pinkness in my experience. And as Ed, Ed, for Edward, that's you know a very important part of why he doesn't like this notion of phenomenal consciousness. So, is there is there any experimental philosophy on whether this this experience this intuition of trans transparency is is held by the public? Do either of you know? So not direct literature, not literature on directly on this topic, but there's literature on what people think about colors. Um, what people think about paint. So you might think that color experience is transparent, right? When we have a uh, when we have the color experience of seeing something red, it's the redness of the apple we are attending to. It's not some redness in my head. So there's a bit of literature on uh, what you know what is color for non philosophers. So um, and I think the 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 emergent, I think there's a bit of a debate. I think the dominant uh, view, uh, the consensus is that lay people do identify color as uh, features of external objects. And, uh, and I think that's how philosophers tend to think about color as well. It's a bit of a literature on pain. Um, so, you know, is pain just, so when we have an experience of pain, um, are we attending to some feature of our body part or is that some feature of our, experience you know like is is this thing that we're attending to in our body part um so some experimental literature suggests that um pain is really people tend to think of pain as this uh condition of the body so maybe that's all some indirect ev evidence in favor of transparency thesis um you know i think folk probably find transparency uh, thesis very intuitive Okay, let's go to two more questions, and then maybe we can wrap it up a day. We're, we're, we're gonna, we said we were not going to go for two hours. We've gone over the two hours mark. It's been <laughs> such good fun. Uh, question from Luke: Is it correct to think of this to think uh, to think of this work as a socio-cultural account of the meta problem of consciousness? So the meta problem is another term of David Chalmers for the problem of why we think. Who's the we here? Is it just philosophers? Is it people in general? Whoever the we is why we think there's a hardness um and he's and various there's various explanations of that 
do, can we see this as, as 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 answering that question by giving a kind of socio-cultural account of that? What do you reckon, Edward? Is that how you see? Oh yeah, I think this is quite right. I mean, I I uh, um, I, I I agree. I think this is a nice way to 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 put it. Both the contrast between ancient philosophy of mind and the emergence of something like a hard problem of consciousness in the 17th century and the role of contemporary philosophy in making that a real issue and the contrast between philosophers and people. Yes, I agree. I agree. I think this is, a, I didn't put it quite in, the, in these terms, but I think this is a nice way of, of testing the issue. Maybe final question. Sorry if I've missed early questions in, 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 the, in the thread. I'll do better next time. Uh, from Lance Independent. This is Lance Bush, who does a lot of good uh, YouTubing, philosophy YouTubing. Check it out. Uh, so he says, phenomenal consciousness is mostly discussed in the analytic tradition, it's Anglophone philosophy. It may stem from and be discussed primarily with populations that are psychologically unrepresentative of humanity. So maybe we can see this as, as critical of Michelle, although uh, see what Edward thinks about it as well. So even if, even if the public do have this intuition of the hard problem of phenomenal consciousness, maybe it's just you know, in sort of Western universities or public or something, if we're asking our students or or in weird countries, what's that? I forget what that acronym stands for now. Uh, what, what do you think, Michelle? Could this be a problem that this is not, maybe, um, not, doesn't, maybe not a universal intuition? Uh, I very much question that. Um, uh, well, I, I, I don't think there's data on, I think all the experiments, all the studies are done uh, within uh, speakers of, I think English speakers. Um, so I don't think there are data from other cultures. I, I like to think, so I've, I've talked about this with my mom in Chinese, and I like to think there's a pretty good word in Chinese that describes, um, you know, the feeling, the, the, the phenomenal aspect of experience. And it, it's quite similar to the English word feeling, the feeling of pain. Um, and I always felt like that Chinese word is, is, is uh, quite adequate at capturing this aspect that of experience that philosophers are interested in. So I'll be very interested to see some cross culture data. But my uh, prediction is that uh, you're not going to find much culture differences. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Well, what do you think, Edward? Um, I the answer is I don't know. Uh, some something that is relevant, but I haven't really looked in detail. Is there's a lot of work in the Indian philosophical tradition on things that are not unrelated to to consciousness. Now I'm f I'm far from being an expert. I'm a, I'm at best at best an amateur, uh, and I, but I do suspect there might be things here that uh, maybe could be interpreted in light of of uh, phenomenal consciousness. But again, I'm I'm just just not an amateur. That would be a place to look at. To try to get a, a handle on this kind of, of of question of troll. I mean, yeah. So that would be one thing to do. I have done some work on the Marie intuition across cultures a long time ago, unpublished, and I don't remember what the results were. So I can't I, I can't tell you. I was trying to find them on my computer when I was talking, but it's 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 somewhere hidden on the corner of my computer. We'll have to check it out. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. I've I've really enjoyed this discussion, and um, I've got a, I've realised I've got a lot more to think about on this stuff. So thank you for coming on and giving us a very stimulating conversation. Thank, thank you, you Philippe. Thank you, Keith, and thank you, Michelle, for for the discussion. It was actually really really enjoyable, and the two hours flew flew very quickly. So <laughs> yeah, same here. Thank you very much. It's been really fun. Yeah, and thanks to the audience too. That's the problem. It goes too fast, and then we end up having these epic videos uh, that no one wants to listen to because they're too long. No, they do really. Well, no, I mean, I think there's been a lot of disagreement, a lot of diverse opinions uh, conducted very civilly. But as we often end up end up end up saying on this show, I think you know, despite all the disagreement, I think there's there's one thing we can perhaps agree on, although maybe not in this case, is that you know, consciousness, if it exists, is wherever it is and nowhere else. <laughs>